Welcome to Seeking God's Way Bible Study Series, which leads to a new life. Before you, you have your booklet, and we're going to be using this booklet for our Seeking God's Way Bible Study Series. So here we are. We're up to, is it complete? And so we're going to start right over here in our chart, just like we have there word. Is it complete? Now we've looked at the origin. We looked at the purpose. And we see that the Bible has a specific purpose. It may be used for all kinds of things, but we want to use it for God's purpose. So there we have the purpose. Okay. Now we're going to look at, is the Bible complete? This is a real serious question in its own way. Uh, we have the Bible, and we, we've been using it and looking at it, uh, but did God give us everything we need? That's an interesting question. So that's the, what we're going to be actually looking at. So we're going to start with uh, Jesus talking to his apostles in John chapter 16, 33. So we'll move over to John chapter 16, and uh, get ourselves there. 13, right? Oh, yeah, verse 13, oh. sorry. Yeah, John 16, 13. Got that? Yes, I do. All right, Marlon, start us off. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Okay. Now, this one's very important, uh, maybe to kind of prep it a little bit. First, we don't want to forget who he's talking to. Some people read this and they think he's talking to me. He's not. He's talking to the apostles that he chose. He gave them a special task with special privileges to accomplish that task. One of those privileges is mentioned here. that The fact that they were going to receive how much truth? All truth. All truth. Now we're back to that word all, right? We started out there in uh, 2 uh, Timothy 3.16 where he said the scripture was all inspired mm -hmm. by God. Now we're here again. Does it mean the same thing, you reckon? Yes. Yeah, I'll say. So they, the apostles, received all truth. Not just a little of it. Not just for their generation, but all of it. They had a task set before them that made it necessary for God to give them everything they need. And just in passing, in the passage, notice it says that the Spirit himself is not going to say anything. Who is? God. God. So, and we find this throughout the scripture, that the Spirit doesn't initiate this. He is just the, the, the part of God that does the, the, the transmitting of it. It is God himself that is doing this in a very personal sense. So the Spirit was to guide them. Go ahead. Right, that's what I was going to say. God gives you the Word, but the Spirit guides you through it. Okay. okay. And, right. and yet, I, basically, though, it was guiding them in this right. particular exactly. passage yeah. specific. For the apostles. Right. Right. Very much so. Right. They were guided right. in a very personal, direct sense. It goes all the way back to 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, where we started, where the prophet received the message from the Holy Spirit. Right. Okay. They were the prophets that God chose. They, they were called apostles, but they were also prophets. And they then gave what God gave. And that was the purpose of the passage. But I really wanted to put the emphasis, of course, on the word all. Not just a little of it. They received everything. Now, the real question is, did they or didn't they? And I choose to believe that the Bible's right. That's what it says. And that's what it says. Okay, so and if that's what it says, then I accept that they received, in the first century, all of it. Okay, and, and that's a very important little point mm -hmm. because a lot of people today are hearing all kinds of things that they're claiming is coming from God. I prefer to believe that what God said was right, that he gave them all of it. I don't need something else. Okay, now let's see in our second point, we kind of move from that idea to a second point, where the Apostle Paul, who's going around starting churches in the book of Acts, and he started several, and on this particular occasion, we're going to look at two of them. One uh, in Acts chapter 20, verse 27. On this particular occasion, if you were to read uh, before and after this verse, he's talking to the church in Ephesus. Okay. Okay. And in fact, if you look at your Bible books, you can also find a book written to the church in Ephesus called the book of Ephesians. Okay. But here in the Acts uh, um, chapter 20, verse 27, we have uh, Paul talking to them and he tells them something about the topic that we're talking about. So let's see what he says there. 
<clears throat> for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. The, how much? The whole of it. The whole of it, in the first century. Right. Okay, so in the first century, he declared to the Ephesian church the whole council. What if he had used the word, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I gave <laughs> you some of it. Yeah. Wouldn't it make a whole different meaning to the passage? Yep. Okay. Instead, he said, I gave it wholly to you, completely to you. So the Ephesian church in the first century had absolutely everything they needed in the written word that that was being written to them. See, they even have a book written to them, yep. Ephesians, okay, that was necessary for them to be what God wanted them to be. Now, let's see if Paul's consistent. I believe, of course, he is. But let's, let's just see if he's consistent because he says this once again. He says it in Colossians chapter 1, 25 through 26. Colossians 1, 25 through 26. Now, this, of course, is to the church in Colossae. And just like the church in Ephesus, uh, Paul taught them, and Paul started the church. You can actually find the story of the beginning of the book of, uh, of the church in Colossae in the book of Acts. And here we see what Paul says to them. Mark? Right. Of, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. Okay. And mine says, to make the word of God fully known. Fully known. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Okay. What does the word fully mean? Complete. Complete. Well, Is that the same word we're looking at? Yeah, all? All? Yeah. I mean, all. if something is full... You, you can't, can't fill it up anymore. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> right. In fact, that's what the word full or fullness or fully means. You can't put anything else in the cup. You fill them a cup of coffee and you fill it full. You can't put anything else in it, which is the way I like my coffee. Fill up. <laughs> yeah. And good and black. You know. So, yeah, I know you <laughs> but, you know, but, but, the, but the reality is this is what he gave the Colossians. How much? All of it. They didn't need something else. They didn't need something special. They got everything they needed, and Paul gave it to them. Well, that also suggests that it existed, okay? That Paul possessed it like was promised by the Spirit to the apostles. That he got all the truth, and then he gave all the truth to them. Yeah, he held nothing back. He didn't hold anything back. Nothing was hidden. Yeah. He gave it all to them, okay? Okay. Uh, so let's go to 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4, and our little title says, We have everything that we need to please God. Now this is an interesting passage because it's more than just, some people look at the Bible as only a spiritual book, only for the future, you know, getting to heaven, which it is, of course. But this passage goes one step further in talking about the completeness of the Word of God. Uh, and so that's what we want to look at in 2 Peter chapter 1. Three through four. Okay. Um, <clears throat> His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted us his precious and very great promises, that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion and become partakers of the divine nature. Well, it's got so much in there, right? Yeah. I mean, you can spend a lot of time here. But I want to put just our finger on one little part of it for okay. right now. Notice as it starts out, I'll get you to reread it because I'm going to put my finger right on what you, what you read. Okay. Start rereading and I'll stop you. His divine power has granted to us all things. That all. See the word all again? There we are again. What did, what is his divine, divine power, God's divine power do for us according to this passage? Well, it has granted us all things that pertain to life, life and godliness. And godliness. Mm -hmm. Now, here we have two things to look at. We've been talking a lot about godliness. You know, it leads us to heaven. It saves us, these type of things in our purpose. But notice it says life. You know, when, I, when my first child was born, somebody told me, says, well, you know, there's no manual for raising a child. Well, I beg to differ. The Bible is the manual to raise a child. But the Bible is a manual to how I live now, how I conduct myself, the way I should be. Uh, in fact, we can take it one step further. 
it, it offers the idea of uh, what is the best I can be here on this earth and the future. So if I want the best life, where do I go? The Bible. If I want the best children, what do I teach them? The Bible. If I want them to get to heaven, what do I teach them? The Bible. And it says it, it's His divine power that did this and gave us how much? All of it. Okay. Wow. Now we're going to do, um, I don't know, are either one of you good in English? I'm not. But, you know, I, I've well, learned I, a little bit. I speak the language. You speak the language. <laughs> well, sometimes I wonder whether I do. But uh, I like we're, we're, we're going to have a little study in English. Okay. Just, just a little one. We're not going to get too deep because then it gets over my head. Yeah, and I'd have to get me a professor in here to explain it to me. Okay. But what we're going to look at isn't rocket science. Okay. okay. We're going to go to Jude, uh, verse 3. There's no chapters. There's only one chapter to the whole book. So we're And you're right close there to it anyway. And we're just going to look at Jude. And we're going to look at verse 3. And notice our little caption before we read it. It says, the faith. Mm -hmm. Now, the Bible does something funny with language that's a little different than some books. Uh, normally, the word faith is an adjective. You know, it's an action word. Mm -hmm. uh, my faith, this type of thing. But the Bible does something funny with words sometimes. And this is one of those interesting occasions. So let's read the passage, and then I'll explain what we're talking about. We're just going to look at verse 3. Three, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to all the saints. Okay, now we want to put our finger right on that area there where it, where it talks of the idea of the faith, right, mm -hmm. once for all delivered to the saints. Now we're going to do our little English lesson here. When, we, when you put the word the before faith, all of a sudden it changes from an adjective to a what? A noun. To a noun. Mm -hmm. So now we're not talking about my faith. Or we're not talking about faith that's out there somewhere. We're talking about the faith. Now generally in scripture then we're talking about something substantial. Mm -hmm. Here it is. The word of God. The faith. Okay. Uh, now, when we do our English, uh, our little English lesson here, that's the first part of it, of course, that he changed the word faith from an adjective to a noun. But next, he does something else. He says, once for all delivered. Is that past, present, or future? Once. All. That's, that's all of them. Yeah. It can, yeah. but when you use the idea of once, it's something that's been done. Right. Yeah. Now it may lead into the yeah, future. It means that it won't change. But it isn't going to change. Okay. 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 So when it was given once mm -hmm. at one time, then it would never be any other way. Now it says a lot of things. It, it says um, God doesn't need to change it. You see, when he gave it once, it was good enough forever. That's one of the magnificent things about the Word of God. It doesn't change around. Every time you open it, it's going to say the same thing. You say, people have a tendency to change their mind. It doesn't. Okay, it always says the same thing. Uh, and it was done once, and it was proper, correct that time. And in fact, I added a passage on here, Hebrews 9, which uses the same words so that we can look at it in a little different context, but it uses the same words to explain this. Okay, so let's go to Hebrews 9, 26 through 28. And we'll see how the Hebrew writer... Uh, offers the idea of once. And that's what we're looking for when we're reading this, right? The, the same type of language, except he applies it to something else. Okay, okay. Uh, That way we know for certain that this is what uh, he's talking about. Okay. Okay. Um, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Um, and just as it is appointed for men to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Notice the different occasions it uses the term once. once. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first time it uses it for what? 
Christ came. Christ came. He died once. Once. Yeah. And so he's never going to have to die again. He did it once. How many times do I die? Once. Once. And I'm going to die once, and I'm not ever going to die again. Uh, I, we're, we go to the hereafter. We don't come back. Okay? And this was done once. It wasn't going to be done again. It's done once. So when God wrote the Word of God, as Jude 3 says, the faith, He did it once for all, and He's never going to repeat what He did. There's any more than He's going to repeat the death, burial, and resurrection, or any more than we're going to die but once. And so we have literally the Word of God interpreting the Word once for us. Uh, do you recognize the fact that interpret, letting God interpret it allows us to understand what he meant in Jude 3. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it will only be once. All right. When we get down to the bottom, we finish up our chart with how long is the Bible going to be around? Duration of the Bible. And now this isn't a big deal. It's just a few passages to kind of captivate our thinking, to put the whole picture together. Okay, how long is the Bible going to be around? So let's start with Matthew 28, 20. Matthew 28, and verse, verse 20. Yeah, just in the car of a while. Okay. Randy gets there. She's almost there. Well, I'm getting there. Yeah. A lot of Matthew here. Okay. All righty, we're ready. Okay. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Mm -hmm. So how uh, long is uh, Christ going to be with us? Always. <laughs> always. To the end. To the end of what? The age. To the end of the age. You see, there's been three ages. The patriarchal age. It began with creation, and it went to Moses at Mount Sinai. Then we have the mosaical age dispensation or the mosaical age it started with Moses at Mount Sinai mm -hmm. and finished at the cross and then we have the Christian age begins at the cross and when's it going to end? When time ends I guess. Mm -hmm. Christ come back. When Christ comes back. back. Yeah. But isn't that so when so we're, we're, in the day. Yeah. we're in the Christian age. So yeah. how long we're in the Christian age now how long is it going to go on? We don't know. Well we don't know that but he's going to be with us till it ends. So the first, first step in the duration is that Christ will be with us to the very end of the age. Matthew 24, 35. We'll stay in Matthew and we'll look at 24, 35. And our caption says, Word, the word, to endure forever. <clears throat> Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. You see, and we're reading the Bible and it is his words. Mm -hmm. And how long are they going to be around? Forever. Forever, yeah. it says. So, and, and that's even a little, you know, that's, yeah. a, that's yeah. right. That is forever. Forever is the, is the language. So this passage, Jesus himself said, my words, this. they'll never pass away. This. People can't get rid of it. It will not go away. Uh, you know, we use um, one illustration. Uh, in Europe, there was a, a guy, I can't remember his name, but he, uh, uh, he built a whole foundation to get rid of the Bible. And they built a big building, fancy building, and he was an atheist, and he was going to get rid of the Bible. This was his foundation. Well, he died, and they sold the building. Do you know who they sold the building to? The World Bible Society. They print more Bibles out of that building now than anywhere else in the world. Okay. Uh, he passed away. The Word of God did not. Man cannot destroy it. It will go on forever. All right, let's finish up with 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25. First Peter 1, 24 and 25. Marvin, you got the last one. Okay. All flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. There's just a little bit more of it there. Really. Yeah, they kind of separated yeah. there in your Bible. Now this is the word which by the gospel you it was preached to you. Okay, so what's going to last forever? The word the word of God. Of God that was preached to you. Right. So it was a first century thing that will last forever. 
So how long is the Bible going to be around? Forever. How long is Christ going to be around? Forever. It will last forever. So in our chart, we've covered the origin. Mm -hmm. comes from God. The purpose, training, teaching, rebuking, correcting, doing what's right. Completeness, they had it all in the first century. And we possess that in the 66 books that we have before us. And in the end, it's going to last forever.